Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> the devil are you how's your week been all right are you sure okay well look just put that aside for a minute any any stress and worries and woes the main thing is right now that you're here this is the podcast thank you so much for downloading and subscribing it's good news because this week is episode 80 and we meet the actor jemima roper and there's a lot of laughter in this episode Um, A lot of talk as well, obviously. Um, More of that in a second. Now, we've had an overwhelming response to the the badges, the limited edition two-shot podcast badges, and we're just getting all the names and addresses. We're going to do a big badge post off very very soon so hold your horses and don't worry and if you do still want a badge there are a few left go to patreon.com two shot podcast and uh help us out with whatever you can and uh, we'll see what we can do with getting you a badge all the details are on there i might even repost the little mini episode it's only a few minutes just tells you exactly what we're trying to do and how you can help i might repost that later on today on thursday So, um, oh, another thing, as I'm recording this right now, there are a handful of tickets left for the Two Shot Podcast live at the BFI with the one and only Mr. Richard E. Grant. Um, So, what's that? Can you hear that? That's the cat in the background. I've shut the door, trying to get a bit of peace and quiet to record this. He's having none of it. So, yeah, if you're quick, fingers on buzzers, Go to the BFI website and see if you can snag yourself a ticket. If you've already got one, fantastic. I'll see you there. It's going to be a brilliant night. It's Sunday, April the 14th, 7 o'clock start. Bang on, get there about 6.45. Grab your drink, grab your seat, and let's get cracking and have a good night with Richard. I'm very excited about that. And another thing I'm excited about, this. It's episode 80 with the fantastic Jemima Rupa. We talk all sorts of stuff. Um, parenting, work, growing up in London, and even filthy bed sheets. This is episode 80 of the Two Shot Podcast with the fantastic Jemima Rupa. Enjoy. I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> seen her for ages um i think the last time i saw her was just after she was announced as doctor who oh, we were really? in the playground with our kids oh did you go to, <laughs> she sa- little... did you go to the same school no um they uh we just sort of we were just near and we've got a very good mutual friend who's oh. also we've all got kids sort of similar age small community yeah i was getting up this morning i thought i wouldn't put my because it was you know, this weather's been weird mm-hmm. like yesterday it was i had my summer shirt on and now I thought I'm going to London and I look at the forecast and I know it's going to be pissing it down, so it's going to be cold. So I get my jumper on and I thought, I'll put my jumper on. And I get it and I look in the mirror and then I realise I've got this, can you see this? It's sort of stain there. <laughs> right? It's like a new jumper. And I know it's fresh out of the washer, so yeah. I know that I've done a job. And now I'm thinking, I know I'm going to, I'm having a chat with mum later or something and I'll go, yeah, I've got this bloody stain. And without knowing, she'll go, do you know what you need to do? Right, you need some bicarbonate soda, some uh, cider vinegar, mix it together, put it on, pop it in the washer, job done. Now, is that a generational thing? Because I'm, as a parent, I can barely sort of bleed a radiator. Yeah. Whereas I think I mentioned something about a breadboard to my dad next few weeks, and then he was coming down to our house. Yeah, made you a breadboard. Like, he's fucking made it. I wouldn't know where to begin with it. Like, it's proper breadboard with, like, handles and everything. Oh, my God. Are you, what are you like as a parent? Uh, <laughs> I don't make breadboards. <laughs> who do, I, who I does don't make use bicarbon- <laughs> bicarbonate of soda to get rid of stains. But they seem to know I don't even things. iron. I don't iron. I have an iron. But I've, I think my son has watched me iron something once. But I think I tend to buy clothes that I don't need. To iron, or if I do need to iron, I don't wear them. Or Crease I don't free. Put them on. Yeah. You're not one of those. I used to have a girlfriend, and she got. I don't iron, 
But what she used to do was come out of the uh, the washing machine and shake the fuck yeah, out. Yeah, I do of them. that. I do that. And then she goes, "There's no need to iron." Yeah. See, I personally, I quite like an iron. I got some someone someone actually told me off for ironing my jeans. But I like the not fear. a crease down the front. I like a, no, not a crease <laughs> down the front. I'm not that bad. But I do like an iron jeans. That's terrible. Mm. Is that mm. terrible? No, I wish. I, I'd like to be the kind of person that ironed bed sheets. I'd like to be the kind of person that washed oh. bed sheets more than like, <laughs> once every six well, months. You're crossing a line here. <laughs> We're going into cleanliness and just sort of aesthetically pleasing <laughs> sort of nice sheets. <laughs> F- no, fuck ironing and a sheet. That takes ages. Get yeah. it around. Oh, no, no, I can't yeah. bother with that. I'm too, I'm too small. That's for a shake. Sheets. But the, the, the washing thing, I think we need to have a, quite a, a, at least have at least an hour's discussion on that. <laughs> I change my pajamas. I wear a lot of clothes right. to bed. So, and you so I cook, figure that so I have you... clean pajamas. So there's a clean layer between me and bed sheets. So you basically wear like a hazmat suit. Yeah. Just to go to bed. So you're not near exactly. the sheets. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a way. It's a form of going to sleep, I suppose. But. Yeah, we should get on to that. All complaints, uh, JemimaRuper.com, about her cleanliness. <laughs> what were your parents like? Are your parents f- hands-on? Were they hands-on parents? Um, they, they both worked a lot. What, um, what, what, are they, what was your mum? My mum was, well, she was, she was a teacher. She went to drama school, but as a, but as a voice teacher. Did she? And um, so she was qualified to teach voice, but she ended up uh, teaching in schools, uh, in some quite like, rough state schools in I London think. yeah and then you're wet you're w- you're w- west aren't you really? yeah I was born in Hammersmith oh, right yeah and um and but then I don't know quite how this happened but she then got into radio and she used to do hospital radio or something and then she got into well, broadcasting no um as a like newsreader or announcer because and, she um, probably had this she, silky voice. She has, yeah, she, I mean, she used to. She now does what you do. Oh, does she? Va- yeah, constantly vaporised. Um, uh, at, least, at least she's not smoking. Well, yeah, exactly, because she was like 50 a day. Was she? For, yeah, that decades is, that and is, decades. That is professional. But she sounded amazing. <laughs> she still does. <laughs> I know um, somebody that went, <laughs> years ago, she went, no, I can't give up smoking, because what if I, I lose the voice? Mm. Yeah. It's like, oh, fucking just stop it. There are a generation of of actors, I think, that do have all those incredible... Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Not they, they've gone. <laughs> it's the old ones that probably used to do a play and then pop to the coach and horses at the interval yeah. and have two pints and then get back and go and do the play. Yeah. Did you ever read that book um, called Hellraisers? No, so it's the no, sto- I know. Oh my yeah. god, some stories of Peter O'Toole yeah. and Richard Burton and, and Oliver Reed. It's an absolutely fantastic read. Isn't there? There's that classic one where someone was sat in a box and Peter O'Toole like came in and there suddenly his cue arrived and he was like, "Oh, I'm in this scene." <laughs> and then like, <laughs> to like run out. <laughs> there's also one about Richard Burton. Who I think he was doing Camelot, the musical. Yeah, and rode his horse to the Coach and Horses pub. <laughs> Through Soho, <laughs> so have a pint and then we're back. Now, whether that's true, I, I, I want that to be true so much. I want that to be true. I wish it was still like that. Dear. A bit. I feel like I'm one of the last boozy actors. <laughs> now, have you heard this podcast? Now, you're definitely not, so you're fine. Um, or at least on the cast, I feel like, actually, no, I've got a few younger friends that I like that. I mean, it's much better. They're much better behaved and look after themselves. And but all the younger ones, they all go to the gym every day. And yeah. They, you know, and they're all vegans, and they're all, and it's all stuff that you know I would like to be able to do myself. But but look, come on, let's concentrate on washing the bed sheets before you even attempt <laughs> to go down the gym. Come on, <laughs> priorities, please. <laughs> let's go back to your mum getting into radio. Yeah. Yeah, well, she she then did years uh, at Radio 4, BBC Radio 4. She did, like, TV for a bit when I was really young. Mm. She was at, uh, she was in Southampton a lot, doing World Service TV, reading the news on World Service TV. And then she got into BBC Radio and was at Radio 4 for ages and then Radio 3, and now she's... Stopped, stopped. it all. Yeah. And what was, where was your dad at this, t- this point? He was... Uh, he was at the BBC... Both of them didn't have necessarily the best without I because I don't know enough about it. Um, but they didn't have the best time in the end. There, my my mum's Serbian, and during the NATO bombing of uh, 
Yugoslavia uh, would write bollocks on her script no. and they got really <laughs> panicky that she was going to say something on air. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she sort of stopped having shifts for a while and it all got a bit weird. Yeah. And um, and so then she moved to Radio 3 and had a much nicer Happy, time. Happier yeah. time. Yeah. And was, um, she enjoy- was she enjoying what she was doing then? Well, obviously. Yeah. Um, and what was your dad doing at the BBC? He, he was head of secretariat it was sort of a, a quite a sort of high up office job what is that but then What's he head of that? i don't know i I remember, <laughs> I remember being ill once and having to go into the office i had no clue what was going on um uh, uh but he also did when i was really little was away with film crews doing news reels in other countries mm. so he'd often be going to germany for three or four days or going here and there and would direct the news crews. And who was um, who was looking after you at this point? Uh au pairs. You had au pairs. Yeah. Were they sort of live in are they the live in Yeah. 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 One of whom is uh, still a really, really, really good friend. She looked after me when I was really little. She yeah. was sixteen really? when she came and I think my dad helped her get her GCSEs that she needed to study to become a nurse. No and, um, way. And she's one of like four sisters, and she's always just and she looked after me again when I was six, I think. And she's, she's always been, been in the family. Yeah, that's so lovely. Yeah. How amazing of your dad to do that. Yeah. But we started because we started so <laughs> seamlessly. I forgot to tell you, and I don't know if I have told you, and we can cut this out for one or not. <laughs> but um, we give all guests full editorial control over the episode, okay. so. After we finish, we'll send it to you. If there's anything you want edited out, of then course. it's totally fine. So then no one's self-editing as we go along. Do you know what yes. I mean? So it's not like a journalistic, uh, any interview that you've done, yeah. you're, you're yeah. in control. Because so I anything. will put my foot in That's my That's totally mouth. fine. I'm sure you, know, you, you, you listen to podcasts, don't you? Mm. Yeah, so you've heard a few and we have to bleep certain things. And uh, Griff sort of has his work cut out sometimes with some people, but you know... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I was meaning to tell you. Um, were you? <clears throat> did you find your mum and dad being away so much, and because presumably working quite odd hours as well? Mm. Did you? Were you missing them quite a lot, or missing that mother and father figure? Yeah, I think I probably did um, at the time because, like you know, kids, you just you accept what's there yeah. and what's not there and um and you, you i know. never wanted for anything I, you know i had a lovely upbringing but as an only child i get very nervous of my child being an only child um it's sort of a lot of time on your own and sort of a lot of uh i think you get quite introspective very early on and quite stuck in your own head were you bit. like were you like that stuck yeah in your own head? and um uh but I remember, and it's kind of interesting now because what I hate about me being a parent and the unpredictable hours or locations or, like, I feel like I'm either at home all the time yeah. or I'm just suddenly gone. Away for makes a chunk of my time. son sort of more insecure or more because he can't sort of understand how old is he how it works. He's three and three quarters. Right, okay. And Because um, I had this conversation about the only child stuff. Yeah. Because we've only got one. Yeah. And... We were away with some friends at half term and they've just had like a, a six, six month old baby after quite a long time. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you're with another baby and you might feel a bit sort of broody. Yeah. None of that. I didn't feel that at all. <laughs> I mean, beautiful kid. Yeah. But like that ship sailed. I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah. And we've even had this conversation with our son and he's gone, nah, I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm fine. Because <laughs> at first you do worry about that because that, you know, I'm one of three, my wife's one of five. Yeah. And you go, oh, well, you want that sort of big family sort of dynamic, don't you? Do you? I don't know. You sort I, of go what fits for you. I think if you're aware of it and of the things that they don't have that you can sort of help with, yeah. then it's all right. Um, uh, and I, I think, like, because I started acting when I was 13, and if I'd had siblings and stuff, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that because yeah. my mum wouldn't have had time to take me to auditions or do that or help that. So, you know, I can't really complain. And you can't really regret all that? No. So what? when did all this start for you at 13? Because 
Well, I don't want to get into it. I have spoken about young child actors before, and <laughs> some, some, somebody gave me a right old ha- har- harassing on social media. Go, not all kid child kids are like that. I said, no, I know. I've worked with load, and they're absolutely <laughs> lovely. But obviously, it wasn't something that your mum and dad pushed you into. No, no. <laughs> no this, I this comes mom, straight from you. Yes, and, and I don't really know. I think there was a there was I I, I was aware of a girl who at my junior school who was a bit older who was in Grange Hill. Right. And so there was something that I went, oh, you can do that. And I think it was watching watching movies like Oliver and Annie and seeing kids in make-believe. Yeah. But, like, doing it that sort of, I guess, was what I sort of, what captured my imagination. But I can't really remember sort was, of deciding. Was, was there any outlet at school for that when you... No. Um, and I did a lot of stuff out of school and there was, like, a local drama group um, and I did a production of Oliver playing the Artful Dodger. I knew you were going to say the Artful Dodger. I, <laughs> I fucking knew that in my head. Then I went, Artful Dodger, definitely. Mm. Well, it was very funny because me and the boy who ended up playing Oliver, who is now uh, the rapper example, no, Eli- he's not. Elliot Glee. <laughs> That is brilliant. And it, it, we were down to the last, and I remember the, the final thing was the director made us stand next to each other, and I was much smaller than Elliot, and I was like, because I wasn't like, fuck, because I was nine or ten. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be Oliver because I'm smaller. And I was like, oh, and then it wasn't. It was cast that way around. And I think Elliot was really cross. Because everyone wants to be the Dodger and not, no, not of Oliver. Course. No, who wants to be Oliver? <laughs> Nobody wants, you know, you want to forward that. Who wants to hear where is love? You don't want that. I don't care, you little shit. Let's With get, a breaking voice. Let's get back to the pickpocketing. That's what everybody wants to see. Yes. So that was the extracurricular stuff, but there was nothing at school for you? Not really. I mean, that was that was junior school. I, I think most of my schools that I've been to have been to like quite academic schools and, and not good on the arts. I'm and, right um, in thinking that you're very... Clever. Clever at school. <laughs> uh, I I did all right. I was quite naughty at secondary school. Uh, Define naughty. Disruptive. Giggly. I was always... The yeah, mouthy. Yeah. And, uh, but I was always the one that would probably be laughing, so I'd get caught out. But actually, it was someone else making me laugh. Exactly. One of those. Yeah. yeah. We've all been there. Um, and when I first got my first proper job... I had to go away and miss school. At 13? Yeah. And they uh, they were like, she she can only go if she comes back and keeps her grades and is better. And then that sort of helped me knuckle down a bit when I came back. But you obviously have to have, like, a, a tutor with you when you were filming. <laughs> yeah. But we'd do, like, quizzes on James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd fall asleep and we'd put stuff in his mouth. <laughs> really? God, you were naughty. <laughs> that wasn't me, that was the boys. Yeah, blame the others. Yeah, yeah. So then you went back to school. How was it doing that first job at 13? Oh, then? my God, it was, it was magic. It was... Did you ever read Enid Blyton as a kid? It um, was... Is that... Magic Faraway Tree? Yes. Yeah, I used to read all those. Famous Five, not so much. Yeah, Famous Five is what... I did, and mm. I uh, grown up reading loads of Famous Five, and had oh. always identified a little bit with the character that I ended up playing. Oh, really? Um, who was what? a tomboy, and um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of cross dressing in my career, and sort of borderline either like lesbians or just playing men, and um, and that was sort of Artful Dodger was the first. Yeah. God, that <laughs> and, is so uh, true. Just... I've never really thought of that. Yeah, but it is obviously ghosts, men. <laughs> Cross dressers. Lesbians. <laughs> tick, um, tick, tick. Yeah. Um, and uh, we went through a really, really long audition process. And um, it it was quite traumatic at the time because I think I had about five auditions and two of them were like full days where they were bringing different combinations of kids in with each other. Right, so mixing and matching, us, yeah. So sort of workshopping and then we'd all go and sit and wait downstairs and then they'd come and go, what's your name? You can go. And, um, brutal. And it, yeah, pretty brutal. And um, But it ended up going, happening. Going, going, going all right. Yeah. And then um, it was just the most fun I'd ever had in my entire life. And I was doing what I loved. I loved being on set. 
Uh, it was hilarious. I mean, some of the stories, <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be allowed now, like just some of the things that we saw. <laughs> It's okay. You can, you can tell them on this podcast. It's absolutely just, fine. You know, assistant directors in jail for the night for being drunk and disorderly. Really? Or like, no. <laughs> I won't name any names. So right, um, we, can, we can beep it out. But lo, um, and our our producer John Price was amazing. We had like animals. We had like chimpanzees we had a baby elephant in one episode oh my god and we had all these incredible actors guest actors come in for like a week to do episodes and um we were away on location so we were in hotels there was like in the second series we uh had a, had chalets at butlins oh you did another series after that yeah we did it for two years well four months each yeah. year for two years um and uh and there were lots of not so easy things about it, like going through puberty on screen. I was going to say, because kind to me. <laughs> 13, especially when you're a girl, everything's changing. Yeah. And you're also doing like that, because that was like your first job. So you're dealing with all this and you're dealing with what's going on with your yeah. body. And <laughs> how was that? Yeah. Uh, not, not good. I mean, I feel like everyone I went to school with got away with puberty so well and I really didn't. I was very, um, I started the Famous Five and I looked like a little, little boy. And then by the end, I was like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> and I was just, and they had to cut my hair off and perm it. So it wasn't a good look anyway for oh, a, God. it was great for the part. But 1950s, not for you. Yeah. yeah, but not for me. And, um, uh, you know, the boys were constantly taking the piss out of me and I'd wear a lot of hats. Yeah. Because uh, I suppose if you were at, if you were at school, you would have had the support group of like your other friends, your other girls, and you were you could talk about what you were all going through. But then you're on set, and yeah, uh, yeah, there's nothing there. But yeah. was your was your mum and dad around? They must have been around coming onto set, and not really. They they visited like all of our parents would come like maybe once on the shoot but we were quite far the first year we were in just out we were staying in newcastle right and so we were back at weekends but we were back and forth but it was just too far um and i think they yeah all of the parents sort of did a visit a set visit at certain points but otherwise we were with our chaperone and our tutor um lovely steve fletcher dexter fletcher's dad he was your chaperone yeah <laughs> he was our tutor yeah <laughs> <laughs> Is he the one that used to put things in his mouth? Yeah, when you'd go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but he was great. And actually, the second year, he was brilliant because my... The other kids, their schools were quite... Um, they were just really cool about it and, like, really easygoing. And mine were... I mean, they, we did summer exams and I was 14 and they, I had to do my summer exams while I was away. And I was sort of doing them, you know, after a day's filming, having learnt lines for the next day. Oh, it was God. doing, like some kind of science exam at 11 p.m. And um, and Steve was brilliant at just sort of keeping me really chilled out about it and just being like, whatever, and just sort of supporting and doing that. So he, he looked out for me. Are you good in those kind of situations anyway, would you say, in, in an exam situation? Mm, no. I mean, I sort of was at the time, I think. But now I'd... I, now I'd absolutely go to pieces because obviously you know the pressure of an exam and the pressure of going to a, an audition even at, the, at that age yeah. you know there's such a, a, a similar i find it worse now what auditions because, what, because like, you or, because you know more yeah can you i can feel in the room when there's like, not that you ever meet anyone anymore um, it's a very <laughs> rare thing now, isn't it? It's a really rare thing. I liked it when you could go and talk to people and sort of persuade them <laughs> with your well, because, personality. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it, though? Yeah. It's true because half of that is you're going, right, well, I'm going to be here every day and I'll be playing that part, but yeah. you need to know that I'm all right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a decent person and we'll get on, hopefully. But then it's a two-way thing. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to go, well, you're going to be... Direct to me, you're going to be my yeah. producer. What if? Yeah, I don't want to work with you. What you're if a knob. You're a dickhead. <laughs> no way, I yeah. can't do that. I can't do three or four months of that. So, easier as a child? No, harder growing up because you know more. Or because, yeah. or is it either because you know more or you're older 
or it's changed? Both. Both. I think there's... Like, I, I, I get more nervous now, and especially the whole kind of, like, if you have to, like, learn lines for something that you've not even read the script for. Yeah, because you're not and allowed like, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually the scene is from something completely different that has nothing to do with what you're auditioning for. And um, Get your uh, head around that. I find that really hard and yeah. really stressful, and I don't like it. And so I prefer to, like, do the self-tape at home. But then uh, I get really anxious about self-tapes and could spend hours doing them because then I'll look and go, but oh, well, they can see my wonky eye and then they're going to cut me because yeah. my eye is down <clears throat> by my chin and this and this and whatever and you get in a whole world. Have you ever of... not watched? No. No. Why do you try and not watch it? <laughs> well, because, and I'm only saying that because if you're on, if you're at work on set, after you've yeah. finished a scene, you don't pop around and... Go and watch it, dear. No. So I should though. I no, just sort of <laughs> I don't think you should. I don't think you should. I'm dead against it. I just saw some That's ADR. not your job. That's not like, your job. Oh, in my head I look like I'm like I'm Kira Knightley. <laughs> and then I see it and go uh, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. That's why I play men all the time. <laughs> but that's it, you know, do we are we too worried about that? Should we go, well, no, because my job is this, and everybody's got their jobs on their department. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't think twice. I mean, you would never think twice of going up and going, see that light? Maybe you want to just sort of move it that way. Imagine. <laughs> Some do. Uh, <laughs> I've seen, I've seen, yeah. Have you? Yeah. Oh, no, I can't. I've learned very quickly not to get yeah. involved with other people's business like that. It's kind, of, kind of a rule for life, really. Isn't yeah. It? Though I remember, like, because when kids on set, we were allowed to just like. I remember just like loving going to pick up wedges from tracks and like helping collect all the wedges, and like in that felt really nice and hands on. And then as an adult, <laughs> you try to do the same. Can you imagine? <laughs> what are you give doing? Us the, give us that tape. I'll mark like, myself on the floor. It's great. What are you doing? It's like sit there, <laughs> drink a cup of tea. Can you imagine though? Kids nowadays on set wouldn't wouldn't be allowed to be doing things no. like that. Not at all. No. So as it's got very noisy to my I think I we know. better lean closer into the mic. Much closer. So you finish that second series. Yeah. And you're you're fourteen. Mm. Things are changing all over the shop. But that's done. That's that job's done. Yeah. You're back. You're going back to school. Yeah. How did that? F- how did that feel? Awful. Um, I especially the first after the first year when I was still thirteen. I remember I got back and I I did proper grieving. I used to think that I saw people from the crew like every day yeah they're catching our eye and uh i think it was pretty miserable and also i hated school i hated it why did you hate it so much it just wasn't for me (laughs) um it felt i don't know i think uh there was there were expectations maybe more from my mum who hadn't gone to university and sort of wanted Oh, that's, that she wanted to me. live that precariously through you. Yeah, but also just also because I did all right at school, I, think I you, could I think, go. I you think know? I think you did probably very well at school. <laughs> if you read my IMDb, it tells you all about it, which was written by my mum. <laughs> was it? I was like, mum, no one cares if I got ninety CSEs. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> Do you mind me for past? <laughs> So the A, the A the A plus student hmm. is written by your mum. Yeah, yeah. I'm half in love with your mum already. To be honest, she sounds ace. <laughs> She's very funny. Um, so, so she must have, your mum and dad must have been very supportive of you when you were a child doing what you wanted to do. Yes, it took me a number of years of kind of like Persuading. relentless, yeah, relentless. Like, let me do this. Let me do this. Let me do this. And I think. Mum, because basically what happened is a sort of old friend of hers who was a casting director saw me play Artful Dodger and cast me in these uh, Channel 4 and this company, the Children's Film Unit, used to make a film every year yeah. during the summer holidays and teenagers would learn how to do the camera and sound and stuff and they would write a movie Which and then cast it. brilliant. Brilliant. I wish it was, maybe it is in some capacity, but then I think that a newspaper was involved with it and helped fund it and, and it would, get on telly oh, and um can you imagine 
something like that and lots of things like that going on. Yeah, but there's so many, like, and that's the thing that I really, like, opened my eyes as a kid was seeing all these jobs, all these different kinds of jobs that you can do. And, you know, on a set, there's someone who can do anything for you. There's someone who can make you a cupboard. There's someone who can paint that. There's someone who can make take your, the most beautiful photograph. Make you a breadboard. <laughs> make you a breadboard. How funny. How funny. It all, it all, <laughs> see, it, see you, people think these conversations aren't planned. It's all planned. It's meticulous. Seamless. And um, that was so exciting to me. And I, I can't my point now. No, but the thing is, if things like that were still available for everybody throughout the summer holidays, you know, because I know there's places, there's, you know, Oldham Theatre Workshop and mm. uh, Nottingham Television Workshop well, where they, they get to do lots of little things and they get to do right and they get to do the camera well, all work. The, all the Shane Meadows. Yeah. Lot. And actually there were loads, um, in fact, loads of people that I worked with on The Famous Five all from the Nottingham Workshop. Right. And because they did like a whole full UK kind of scouring the land. Mm. And, um, and so, yeah, all those... Uh, drama workshops and stuff are the ones that did the best and had and the kids all were working um and doing stuff and there were all these opportunities because they're inspired you know yeah. there's so many i get emails from people sort of week in week out and very young people who can't can't go to drama school for all sorts of reasons yeah. you know mainly financial they go i've got a place but i've got no money so i can't do it what can i do next and if things yeah. like this were available for like you know 16 to 24 year olds for for very little money yeah that'd be helping them and inspire them to to do other yeah. things to you know pick up a, every, you've all got smartphones now pick up a bloody phone make your little yeah. film you you can you know you can do this yeah <sighs> and i've got a little especially when sort of between the ages of like 18 and my early 20s when everyone else is at drama school mm. i had a little gang and we were all the child actors that would just sort of keeping going yeah and um and they are all still working a lot of them are making their own stuff as well and doing all that and that there are so many different routes into the same thing which i think is really important to know and that there isn't just this one track no thing but yeah acting i think is really hard if you don't live in london and you're somewhere else and you can't afford or you don't get into drama school then what do you do? But again, necessarily, as you just said, there's so many different paths and that's it might not be the right path for everybody. Yeah. You know, I've spoken to so many people who didn't, you know, who might have been doing some stand-up comedy and then they fell into acting or yeah. they're a bloody cleaner and then yeah. they, someone saw, you know, there's so many things that, that can happen. But I know it's frustrating for people. I, I really know it is. I'm not saying it's easy yeah. at all because it really isn't. Um, Did you go to drama school? I did go to drama school, Mount View. Ah, yeah. They've but moved, I, but I live near there. They've moved to Peckham. Yeah. I've got a very nice campus now, which I must go and visit. But I was very young, I was 17. Yeah. Just on the cusp. Yeah. You know. um, was I too young? I don't know. Anyway, mm. who gives a shit? It's not about me. It's about <laughs> you. So your mum's friend was a casting director. Yes. <clears throat> That's where we were. Yeah, and so she, yeah, and so I did a, a film for the Children's Film Unit uh, uh, what when I was 11. 11? So yeah. this is before Famous yes, Five? Yes, because that was my first proper, 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 proper job. Right. Um, uh, and I, and then she also cast me in a little musical at the King's Head Theatre Pub. It the is next year, playing one of Oscar Wilde's sons, yeah. Yeah. So that was another boy part. <laughs> <laughs> and the boy playing my brother was at my boys' school... Uh, but his agent was Sylvia Young. Righto. So that was when he knew that you could go to school like a normal kid, but also have an agent. And I joined Sylvia Young's, and then I did Saturday classes. There. From 11 to, yeah, till 13, really, right. and then a little bit um, beyond. Uh, and summer courses there and all sorts, and I'd do modern jazz <laughs> tap tick, tick, and tick. singing yeah and um and it also and it took a while for sylvia and i guess some of the other agents and stuff to kind of spot people and i remember sort of i'd get invited to go and sing in the choirs with the full-time kids um and so i had a little bit of that and i was desperate to go to the school that's what i would have wanted to do i'm kind of in hindsight 
I'm glad that, you know, I had the version that I had. Um, which in was? In the long run, which was normal school and college and stuff. Um, but I was, yeah, I mean, I was completely... I was terrified by Sylvia Young Theatre School. I was terrified of all the other kids who were so accomplished and kind of brilliant and just in this machine. But at the same time, I just wanted to... Do that. And because you were with a load of like-minded people who yeah. were, who wanted and something the, just like you. And I was obsessed and stubborn, I guess, and just completely one-track minded, which I think was the thing that really worried my mum about it. Because it's it's a lot and you know, she she lived with actors when she was, you know, in her late teens and early twenties, and she knew that it's a precarious life and Brutal. you wouldn't want that for your child. No, of course. And, um, so do, do, do you think, in hindsight, that she was thinking, well, let's she can get it out of her system now? Yeah. Oh, completely. And I think she thought, uh, you know, going to a few auditions and getting rejected and whatever would sort of She'll be learn enough. Quick. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is that you do, but something keeps you going back for more, you more know, and more rejection. Kids are kind of bulletproof, though. Yeah. I think you know. You were saying before, oh no, it's got harder, but it wasn't. It wasn't that hard when you were a, you were a kid because it's got no. harder because, you know, do we lose that sense of we brush it off and we move on yeah. to the next? We yeah. hold, do we hold things yeah. much more now in, in everything in, in everyday life? Yeah. We do hold on to things a bit more, don't we? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> she says definitely. Definitely. Due for another therapy session soon. Um. So after school, you're thinking, your mum's thinking maybe she's growing, she's going to grow out of this. Were you thinking, oh, no, I'm going to grow out of this? Or were you quite tunnel vision oh, about tu- it? Oh, tunnel vision. And I, I would work every summer holiday. Also, when I, when I was doing, when I was a kid, you could only work 40 days a year or 80 days a year until you were 16. And then when you were 16, you are unchaperoned and you're an adult. Yeah. And um, I went to a sixth form college for my A levels, who we were very flexible. So they would sort of say, "Yeah, you can." They, they weren't worried if I took a term off; you could kind of like catch up a bit. Oh, that is flexible. And um, and so I did like a few jobs. And the second year, when because I did theatre studies A level, and you have a practical, and so it, you don't want to let the rest of your group down by being absent. So no. I remember like not taking jobs. Um, when it sort of got to that kind of time. Um, but everyone was really just sort of like chilled about it. There were boys that kind of played semi-pro football and there was a Russian pop star there and, you know, it was kind of anything goes. So <laughs> it was quite nice. But I remember having to do choose which A-levels I was doing because I did theatre studies. Um, I didn't do art, which I would have loved to have done because it would have been like a weak thing to do a degree Right. Uh, and then in the end, I didn't apply for university because I just had no interest in... There was nothing I wanted to study. And uh, what, what did your parents think about this at the time? I think probably disappointed. But because the work was coming at that point, there was very much the sense that, like, if it dries up, then I'll apply for drama school. And that was sort of enough of a, a thing. And um, and I did a TV show that was the first time I sort of played my own age, like when I was eighteen. Yeah. And so that sort of helped bridge the gap between. I've been playing like twelve and thirteen for a really long time, and then suddenly I was sort of playing a young adult. So that sort of helped career-wise just bridge a kind of tricky gap. And did you feel at that point at eighteen that the work was coming in? So you thought, yeah, I am going to do this for yeah. a career. Was there never any doubt in your mind? Never any doubt. Um, the only things like now in hindsight is like exactly like there was definitely a period where suddenly everyone your age is getting out of drama school and they're new and they're fresh and they're really well trained and they're not. And, you know, I was still making mistakes. I mean, we all, you know, still never are. perfect. Yeah. No. Um, but there's loads of things that, uh, and theatre wouldn't really see me at all. I never had any theatre auditions. And Did you want to? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of a musical <laughs> and I think I would have been very happy doing that. Um, but my agent at 17, when I moved to a, a grown up agent, yeah. she's still my agent now, um, 
he I remember sort of sitting down and having a plan and it was kind of like okay you do your A-levels and then and then we'll see and we think you know you're going to be a serious actress and uh so Pop no you in that there. yeah that's where you are um and actually I don't think that's where I sit as comfortably <laughs> <laughs> and um and I've sort of been fighting against that um a bit uh it's funny you say that at that age, you know, you sit down and you make a plan because mm. you can't plan anything no. in, in this business. And, you know, we've talked about it gets harder as you get older. Yeah. And so thinking about making any sort of plan is yeah. kind of redundant. Yeah. And you just got to see what, where, you know, where people want to employ you and if, and where you sit and what you want to do and you can't possibly know people always go what do you want to do next I'm like, i don't know yeah because suddenly something will land in your inbox with a part that you would never have mm. imagined for yourself and also what um, a ridiculous question because what do you mean i've got no choice yeah how do you feel about that about the, that lack of choice uh bad about it because i think it got drastically reduced coincided with becoming a mum um, and being a woman in my 30s, suddenly the parts just weren't there. Um, they've been a, a bit more there in theatre, but not uh, in TV, where I was sort of... You, really since my late 20s, I would say. So a good t- last 10 years. Right. And um, and you sort of think, oh, it's because I'm, I'm working in the theatre and I'm doing that. But actually, no, it's just they weren't there for me. And you sort of feel like, oh, I haven't got a place at the moment. And that's really weird. How, how do you cope with that? Um, go and get drunk. <laughs> not, not anymore. It's one way. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. And I don't think Cramming I do cope hand. with it very well. But it is really frustrating. It's really frustrating. Uh, I find that all my male friends are always working. And uh, or auditioning for loads of stuff. Not all of them, but most of them. And so many girlfriends who are brilliant, who just don't even get the meetings anymore, let but, alone... But they used to. Yeah. And, um, uh, and yeah, that's just quite a weird thing. And obviously there are, like, you know, there are loads of very successful women my age who are doing it all and uh, have been really lucky. And sometimes it's hard to forget about the thousands and hundreds of thousands of the other ones who aren't. Yeah. That it is just a handful. And also um, when you're in that situation and you're looking at, like, your peers, all you can see is the, the ones that are working. Yeah. And the ones that yeah. are getting the meetings. And then you, it's very hard because you can get very insular about it. And, yeah. Um, it's sort of the, sometimes worry kind of snowballs. And you can't, I could, sometimes I can't stop. Th- you know, when you yeah. start thinking about, I suppose the best analogy is, you know, when you're really, really physically tired yeah. in your dirty bed, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you, you go, I just want to sleep, but you can't, I have, sometimes I have problems that I can't yes. switch my head off. I'm just constantly sort of racing. Oh yeah. And the worry just can get out of control, but I don't know, what do you do? What, what do you do? Where do you... I d- I'm not, I'm still, still haven't figured that out. It's like, what do you do in the downtime? Uh, part of being a parent has been really liberated that. And also because the way I no think downtime. about it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you've got stuff to do. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of make the most of it. Like, but then you worry about money more. Um, Cause it's not just you. Yeah. And um, uh, that's kind of helped me. It's helped me be more practical about work like I used to I mean work was 99% of my life and now it's 40% 50% because it's not about you anymore yeah yeah and um, also you you know we've got bills to pay yeah food needs to be put on the table yeah and um and so and and suddenly your need is different which is actually kind of nice and it kind of takes the pressure off weirdly because actually like I can just call my agent and go "I, I need a bit of cash and I'll do a little episode of something, or you know, because that kind because of thing. then it, it ceases to become anything from an artistic point of view. It's a it, it's a financial thing, yeah. and it's just the same as going. Well, I need to go and get a quote unquote proper job. 
and I'm, I, I, you know, I'm scanning in Sainsbury's or I'm, do, I'm doing something. Yeah. Because I need to bring in that money. Yeah. And I can't just not do anything. Yeah. How does that make you feel when you're doing something that is purely for, for the financial reward? Do you, are you quite clear about that? I'm just doing this because it's money. Yes. Even though I don't particularly believe in it as as a as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and think that all, happens a lot. We've all been there. Um, yeah, oh, God, yeah. But it, it, and it goes in waves because then it, pride and ego come into it quite a lot. That's always the hardest thing. He's like, oh, if I take this. I remember I had, I had that, like, because I went back to work when my son was eight months old and I did a show in the West End, which was, I loved the show. Um, uh, but I didn't have loads to do in it. So it was kind of perfect and it was manageable. And that was, and I thought, oh, right, I'm back, I'm back in the swing of it. And then after that, I didn't work for ages. For how long? Like, another, like eight, nine months. And then I, w- I think I went up for a TV thing that I'd read the sort of breakdown and it sounded like quite an integral part in the show. Auditioned on tape and then didn't hear anything. And then a couple of months later, got a call going, oh, that part you went for in that thing, you got it. And I was like, great. I then read the scripts and the part was nothing. tiny yeah. and nothing. And I thought, God, but what do I do? And I was like, Cause I, I need... I need it. I need to do it. But at the same time, it felt like I'd taken 30 steps back. Yeah. And you're suddenly like, oh, God, but then you don't want to be seen as, like, that person. But at the same time, you just need to, anyway, you know, just fucking swallow your pride and get on with it. And actually just working. I'm always just better when I'm working. And it doesn't actually matter. And I've been doing it too long. And there's always, like, mates there people that you've worked with before and it's kind of all right and you kind of also have the excuse of like yeah i just need need the money but i think people do know that nowadays yeah. and you know especially when you've been doing it probably that as long as i mean you've been doing it a lot longer than i have <laughs> <laughs> but decades darling. it's 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 kind of people know don't they you go well we've got to do it because yeah. you've got to pay. and I think I learned very quickly. Yeah, swallow, leave that pride <laughs> and ego. Don't fucking even bring that. Yeah, onto set. It's not welcome, and it's yeah. not good for you. It's not good f- for you uh, mentally. No, because then you know I talk about worry. That's that's going to come. Yeah, and play around with the worry. And also, the nice thing about it is that you don't have to. If you've got a big part in something where you're carrying, you're shouldering a bit of the responsibility. The pressure of that, and then family life at home and trying to juggle those things and kind of going and deliver at work and trying to deliver at home is is pretty tough. So at least if you're not, you know, if you're doing a little spit in a coffin something, you can just turn up and enjoy it and just... I love Te- just being... You know, I just love being on set. I, know, I love being for around what it people. Is. Yeah. And is that's... So, it's always, like, each job. There's been... You know, I've had some, like, great parts that I've adored and love doing. But the things that I remember are, like that best mate that I met on that or those hilarious people or, or that little story that's <laughs> yeah. just before a take. Yeah. W- what was it like going back to work after becoming a mum? Especially, I mean, I know you said going back to the, cause I w- wanted to talk about doing theater when you're a mum. Yeah. Cause that's gotta be tricky. Yeah. It, it, uh, the tricky bit of that, was I, I was desperate to go back to work. Oh, I wanted well, yeah. to be I wanted to be the mum that was like breastfeeding between takes <laughs> and like doing all of that. I mean friends of mine that have done that would probably be like, no, you really fucking don't want to be that that woman. Um, it's funny isn't it because you do hear about some women who go, I don't oh no, I don't want to go back to work now. Yeah. This this is it now. This is yes. it. this is it for me. Were you yeah. ever worried that that would change for you? <laughs> No, I think I probably feel a bit guilty that I w- didn't <coughs> do that, or part of me feels guilty that. Um, but it was also, I think, uh, as well, I was a bit naive to how much uh, baby does change your life. And actually, it did me good that I didn't have the excuse of going to work. Right. And actually, being at home and being around uh, was the best thing for me. And my little boy. Yeah. And um, 
uh, but going back at eight months, he he luckily weaned himself off the boob because um, that was a big panic of like, what do you do about feeding them? And um, and he was sort of on quite a sort of rigid nap thing that I just wrote out like sides of A4, like a mental person for the grannies to contend with um, and his dad. Were you um, having family around you? Because do you sort of live near your family? Yeah, I moved, I moved to the opposite side of London quite a long time ago from, from my mum, <laughs> who I love. Um, but uh, she now uh, has moved nearby and is on hand, which is great. That's brilliant for you, he yeah. Has, um, yeah, because even, even with that help, uh, the amount of money on nursery or an au pair we had for a year while I was doing a play. And um, it's so much money all the time. Um, and also, if you're going back to do theatre, it's not the most financially no. rewarding no. thing. And if you're paying, you're paying to do that job. Yeah. Which is sort of what I'm about to start doing again. Oh, <laughs> like, are you? Yeah, and it's just these agonising uh, decisions that you make when you're offered work. And it's so strange to me, even now, I think we're so not used to feeling like we can say no to things. And, um, and this is a great part in a great play, but for no money and I've got a month away out of London. Right. I'm just going, can I, can I make this work? And um, and luckily, one of the other actresses and the director both have small children, so sort of between us, I think we can sort of support. And and the director has had a, a, amazing conversations with us about what we need, what time, you know, rehearsals, having shorter days so that they can do drop offs and pick ups and all of that kind of thing. And That's it just brilliant. changes everything. Well, so many people don't think about that being a working parent, no. especially having one so young. Yeah, they just. Oh, we don't, they don't, yeah. <laughs> they don't take it into consideration at all. So how fantastic that, yeah. that, that he's got that mindset already. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of knowing what to ask for and, uh, which is <clears throat> the most difficult thing. And especially the first time you're a parent with a young child, because also it changes week by week. They're a bit different and their needs are different. So yeah. you never really know what you need to be doing, but I've been, <clears throat> the jobs that I have done where I've gone, uh, yes, I'll do it, but I need to finish at five every day. Mm. It's like, fine, no problem. And usually they're dealing with, you know, another cast member that's already in another show that has to have matinees off and all that kind of thing. And like suddenly it's a bit of juggling for everyone, but it's all possible. Yeah. If people feel like they can ask for it. But they should be, they should ask and they should mm. feel that they should ask. And, if they're in, if they're in that situation where they can't ask, that's not the situation they should be in. No, and I know it's terrifying sometimes. And you just pitched pitched in there something about you know, oh, do I say no to certain things? Yeah, I'm a big believer in that it is healthy to say no to certain things. Yeah, because if your gut is going, I'm just not, but I know I need to do it. Yeah, but then again, if I do it, it's going to make me really unhappy. Yep. So therefore, it makes me unhappy. It makes everybody who's around me unhappy because I'm no good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's always that. There's a massive, there's a massive spin-off, isn't there? Yeah. So, what do you do in those situations? Do, are you good at saying no? No, I, I'm not really. I'm so indecisive at, at, at the best of times that it's so. Um, I'm constantly, even b before being a parent, I was like this. These sort of jobs that come in, that you know suddenly go on the table and you and it's just it's not a clear yes or no because there's sort of good and bad things about them or but it's good to weigh up isn't it it's yes. good to weigh things up and yeah. look at things you know the for and against yes i've had the few times in my life where i've tried to do like the courageous thing and say no on on the off chance of waiting for something else it's always gone very badly for me so i've sort of gone a bird in the hand yeah just Get on with it, and then you don't know what you're missing. Well, you go, well, if I wasn't doing it, what would I be doing? Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, it's nice as a parent, it's nice to go to work to have a bit of a break. 
Oh my god! <laughs> well, this is the thing, Craig. <laughs> this is it. yeah. This is it. That is literally. I, it's like oh my god! I remember the first time like going on the tube to rehearsals and just having a coffee and not carrying like a bag full of nappies oh, and stuff. And just only having to remember my own stuff. Yeah. And um, but then you know it goes so quick, and now I'm already at the stage where my son's going to go to school in September. It's not. And then suddenly he's just going to be gone, and I'm going to be like, "What am I going to do?" I'm unemployed, just sat there washing bed sheets, which I will have time for. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a? You know, when you were pregnant, did you have any worries about becoming a mum and also continuing working? Ah, interesting question. Um, I I found <laughs> I found out I was pregnant uh, because I was so desperately hungover. <laughs> one day that I was like, this isn't normal. <laughs> and um, and I found that I was seven weeks pregnant. And um, I I'd been drinking a lot of red. I had a like craving for red wine yeah. clearly when I was pregnant. And um, uh. And then I was, I'd been offered a job that I'd done in the West End, um, the play Blythe Spirit with Angela Lansbury. And um, I had an amazing time and they were doing a North American tour of it. Right. And it was like starting in November and going through till March the next year. And, um, and it was going to be like two months in LA, a bit in San Francisco, a week off, uh, Toronto for three weeks and then Washington. And it was before the 12 week scan and all of that, but I sort of was like, well, I, I know this part, I can do this part, I can do this part pregnant, um, that's what I'll do. So I said yes to the job. And then I think I had the 12 week scan the day before I flew to LA and um, got out there and we were sort of talking and I thought, well, I should tell them. I was gonna say, so you, not, you can... haven't told them yet. No, and it was that weird thing of like, you don't wanna tell them before it's official because it can all, go wrong exactly and um and i also you know i thought you know they they most of them know me it's all okay i think i told the lead actor um who you know was fine and didn't think anything of it and um and uh and i told them so that because they were about to start casting the understudies and i was like so you know you'll be going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah cast someone <laughs> you'll be going on and um they, uh, and also because I thought, uh, tell the costume so that we can, like, make some refinements to the costume. Yeah. And it was, for whatever reasons, none of it went very well in terms of communication. I think I didn't really know what my rights were. Um, and I didn't have, I didn't sit down with the right people and sort of talk about how we could do it. And also that weird thing of not knowing if you're going to be really sick. Not knowing if, yeah. you know, all those things. And actually, I'd never been better in my entire life because I wasn't, wasn't drinking, I wasn't hungover. <laughs> uh, my memory was like... and um, Those lines were just coming out. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I felt brilliant and... Were they worried, kind of, like, insurance-wise? I think so. And, um, and the thing is, I should have been a bit savvier about that and, and sort of talked to them about that and just sort of just sort of been handled better by me and by them really yeah but this has never happened to you before so how are you supposed to know what, no, what the best thing to do is and it's again it's still that thing where it's all a little bit taboo and it's all a little bit and i think even now it's probably a bit different or maybe it's just because i i would handle it very differently yeah another time but the great thing was is that i did manage to uh not let them kick me out oh, so for did, as long as possible. So you did, did you and do so the full tour? About, no. Um, I went home early. And even though in principle I was really upset and angry about it, in reality I was ready because I was suddenly quite big. Yeah. Um, and was this, we, you said you left, sorry to interrupt, were you, yeah. were you told to leave? <laughs> no, they sort of... Uh, the, <laughs> I, I really loved them all, and uh, uh, we'll but just, pre just was, preface that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, they brought my English understudy, who had understudied me in the West End, out. Flew her out, and right. they were like, "She's here. You have to go. Really, it's time." So I wasn't. 
the choice was sort of taken away, but they didn't sack me. So they didn't do anything mm, yeah. legally okay. wrong. And in the end, but still. it was for the best. Yeah. It's just that it wasn't very nice. No. Um, but in hindsight, <laughs> definitely the best, even though not at the time, obviously, yes. but especially for you and your boy. Yes. Definitely the best thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I sort of went home and was big and fat for a couple of months and, and then gave birth and it was all lovely. And also, I mean, actually the person who suffered the most was my American understudy who had been cast and then never got to go on. Oh, God, um, yeah, of course. But it was Mel who had understudied me in London. It was great because she got three weeks playing the part. And that's the first time that I think I've sort of seen read conversations about actresses, and I think it happened recently in the last, like, six months, where two actresses shared a role because they had young children or were pregnant or whatever it is. And I was like, that's what we need. That's like, we to should make definitely it. have more of that. And, um, cause then you get, you know, you're, you can, you've got the opportunity to earn a bit of money. Um, and also be rather at home than when be you need unemployed. To be. But yeah. yes, but, but get, you know, not be working yourself to the bone or have a bit of flexibility and time at home as well. And that, that whole experience is what I sort of went, ah, yeah, that's the, that's the way to make it work. That's really interesting. That really should happen more, mm. especially in... Th- I mean, obviously in theatre, obviously. <laughs> be a bit odd if we were doing it on telly. <laughs> uh, I'm, sure, I'm, sure no, I'm sure no editing could we get like around that. like when suddenly someone else is playing a character. Yeah. Is huh? that a different person? <laughs> but in theatre, that's an absolutely fantastic yeah. idea. I wonder why they do that. I wonder if they do that more in America. Would they do that in America? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Was your... You know, we were talking ages ago. Uh, about you being an only child. Yeah. What do you think about having your son and how do you feel with him? Um, I th- he's, he's a very... I imagine he's quite a different child to me. Like, he's much more outgoing um, and very... I mean, he's still very young, but he's... They've got that amazing kind of, like, just no self-awareness in the sense they're just sort of like free and he's always just like making friends and stuff and um and so I don't worry about him in that respect but I worry I worry about the responsibility that he may feel at some point just carrying everything because I think only children can that can be a a factor from your own experiences yeah um, and you'll be, you know, you're the only one. I mean, obviously, like, loads of people, some people don't speak to any of their siblings. Some people don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean, doesn't guarantee anything. It really doesn't, because you can see big families, and it's like, well, none of them speak to any, each other. Yeah. And even when they're growing up, none of them got on. Yeah. So and it's that is, there's a for and against, yeah. really, isn't there? Also, like, everything, everything to do with parenting, you're always going to get it wrong. Oh, absolutely. It's like whatever you do, however you do it, there'll always be the, the flip side of it. Do you ever look at other parents and go, look at them, they've got it all sewn up. They yeah. know what they're doing. I, I have a few actor friends with sort of like older children and their children just want to hang out with them and do stuff and that's what I want. I, want, I don't want oh, my I don't son to that. be really that, embarrassed. That could be me. quite annoying. <laughs> go on, go on, play mates. I'm going, she's going to the pub, look at her. <laughs> <laughs> and I just I'm gonna end things I'm not gonna end it abruptly just like that but <laughs> it's all, what I always find so fascinating with doing these podcasts is when I get people on who I've never met before yeah and they, we've never met before but you always come across to me especially when I've oh yeah there's Jemima Rupert in a photo you always seem very happy <laughs> You, no, do you know what I mean? You've always got, you've yes. always got a smile on your face. Are you happy? Um. <laughs> there we go. No, and right. I'm actually sobbing. Um, uh, yeah, yes, I am. Um, I think a lot of it is a is a learned like outward thing. Like I always, I've always loved like say for instance going on set yeah and going to work and getting on with it and being nice to work with is really important to me in fact more important I think privately I worry about my own performances and that I could have done that better I could have done that you know 
And um, but outwardly, the most sort of important thing is to be nice to be around, and uh, especially when you're going into these intense environments and you have to force bond. these yeah. force these relationships like super quick you're yeah. in and um i think like again <laughs> becoming a parent has really like blown blown off all the armor and i'm sure this happens to so many people and at different points in our lives where we all you know you grow up and you put on all these things that you need to put on to sort of get by yeah and then certain things happen to you and it, and for me yeah being becoming a mom suddenly like blew everything off and it's really nice but i'm sort of like much less afraid of showing emotions and being and having a shitty day and having you know all of that and being a bit more honest about how i'm feeling um but yes i am always i will always choose to laugh and be positive more. yeah and just have a nice time well, I am a giggler. No shit. Yeah, it got really, it's gotten really bad on in theatre. <laughs> oh, God, really? <laughs> it used to be really serious. It was actually on One Man, Two Governors. And uh, we'd finished at the National and we went on this little tour before we went into the West End. And, um, and I remember the band said to me one night we we're out for drinks and they were just like, Jemima, you're so good. Cause we see when James Corden is like trying to make you laugh and is whispering stuff and is doing this with your prop and like doing whatever. And you never crack. And I was like, it's cause my character can't, can't crack. Next night we're doing the show and I caught one of their eyes when that was the exact scenario was going on. And I just creased up and I couldn't. And after that, I was just <laughs> like, but I mean, literally, I mean, oh God, we, I mean, that was a long job. And so we all went a little bit mad at certain points, but there was, there have been points. And, um, uh, and I did uh, a trilogy of plays uh, a year ago with Sarah Hadland and, uh, and Johnny Broadbent and there was like six of us in the cast and we had like open dress rehearsal with all the like the fund fundraising people from Chichester Theatre and we just couldn't get through we just oh couldn't God. do it couldn't talk couldn't see our lights because we were laughing so much and you feel like the biggest cunt in the world that you're being paid to do a job and you can't even speak but properly because you're just pissing it's about it's a horrendous feeling because I it's love a, it <laughs> A little, it's a little bit like being told off when you're at school yes. and you can't stop laughing. <gasps> so you've got this cold sweat that kind of comes on and you're going, this is horrific. I'm yeah. going to get through this. And you're pissing your pants laughing. Yeah. And I think I'm always a bit on the brink of that. And there's always a bit, and maybe sometimes it is sort of nervousness or awkwardness that makes me giggle. But like I recently had uh, with a director and we were talking about a sex scene and she 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 spoke about it and she's a very sensual woman and she was trying to direct the scene and she was getting in... She, she she was helping me and this other woman, like, do something. And, and she said, you know, where do you want to touch each other? And I sort of made out a boob joke. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I think you're trying to make us feel more comfortable. I'm only really comfortable if I'm laughing about this, because I don't know about you, but I find sex really funny. <laughs> um, and, yeah, that's kind of, that's it. <laughs> Jemima, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Did you enjoy it? I did. Yeah. I was really, I'm really worried that I'm going to be the most boring, <laughs> boring you're, interview. You're absolutely not. It was brilliant. I've loved it. Thank you. Thank you. I loved it. And another episode is done. What an absolute joy Jemima was. I mean, she is a laugh and we had a really, really good natter. I hope you enjoyed that. I bet you did. Um, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think you did. I can't second guess, can I? You might have hated it. Who knows? But I want to say thank you for downloading and subscribing. I know, look, how many podcasts out there now? Everybody's bloody starting a podcast. So... The loyal listening community that we have, and also the new people that come on board bloody every day. Thank you so much. If this is your first podcast, 
go and have a look. There's, there's now 80 episodes to choose from. There's, of course, there's actors, there's musicians, there's poets, there's writers, there's all sorts of people. There's artists. Pete McKee's fantastic episode. Or maybe you want to go back to number one. You want to go back to Vicky McClaw and you want to just go through it all week by week. Do that. You can do that. That's fine. You want to binge it? Absolutely fine. Um, so, yeah, really grateful for everybody that's joining us. And the messages, the emails that we get. I got a lovely one this morning from somebody who just listened to Lorna Nixon Brown's episode and she could really relate to that episode and it really helped her. She was having a bit of a struggling time and she asked if we could forward the email on to Lorna. And I think it's really important that guests who come on realise what effect their episodes have on on you, on, on, on us, the listening community. So I did, I forwarded that email on to Lorna. Um, right, I'm going to start waffling. If you're not subscribed, just hit the subscribe button. Please do me a favour. I don't say this every week, do I? I hope not. Please rate and review us. Do whatever you want to do. That would be grateful. I've, I was just on iTunes not so long ago reading some lovely reviews. So thank you to all the new March reviewers. And um, go tell a mate. Tell three mates. Uh, yeah, that's it. I'm going to go. Have I got anything else? No, I don't think so. 19 episodes away from the big 100th episode. What are we going to do? Send me some ideas. Send me some guests. Make it special. Until next week, look after yourself. Give yourself a break. I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff, and this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Take care. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.